Huh? Hello, everyone. I almost did not want to stop the music. Um, I guess we'll, we'll get started since we only have one hour and I want to hear everything from Jindo and Sheila. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, welcome. Welcome to Wild China's Book Club. This is our 47th um, virtual event this year. So good to see everyone and some old friends, Guo Tianying and Ruth. It's wonderful to see your name there. And my name is Zhang Mei, for those who ha we haven't met. I'm the founder of Wild China, and uh, we're delighted to today to have Sheila. Melvin and Jing Dong Tsai join us to talk about their book, Beethoven in China. Um, I'm grateful to have both of them, and they are also husband and wife. So great partnership between the two of you. And for any of you who haven't read the book, don't worry, uh, catch it this weekend. I absolutely recommend it. It's a wonderful read. For me, I thought, you know, I know China, I've heard so many kids learning piano, learning Beethoven, but it gives you a different, different perspective of the history. Um, and I, I had a great time. And also, by the way, it's very short. So I felt I got a lot of ROI for my time. <laughs> So allow me to take um, a couple minutes to introduce our speaker today. Jing Dong is a distinguished conductor and educator and of course author. His career spans 30 years in the United States, including his past position as a professor of performance at Stanford University and his current position as professor of music at Bard College. He is also the director of the U.S. China Music Institute and co-director of the Chinese Music Development Initiative and has conducted numerous rich also orchestras in both China and here in the U.S. Now, Sheila Melvin is, a, is an established writer, author of numerous books. She also writes for Stanford Graduate School of Business and she also currently sits on the board of the Asia Society Northern California chapter together with, I think Ken and a couple of friends here. Her career accomplishments include establishing the US China Business Council's first office in Shanghai and also being elected to the board of governors of AmCham in Shanghai. She also speaks at uh, many prestigious uh, international conferences including Fortune Global Forum, et cetera. Now, so uh, just a few words on logistics. Jingdong and Sheila will talk uh, a bit about their book, maybe for about 20 minutes. And then I'm gonna join for a conversation. And if any of you have questions, please feel free to put them in the chat box and we'll try to get to them as, uh, as many as possible. Now, without further ado, I'm gonna get started with Jingdong and Sheila. Maybe Sheila, I'll start with you, um, tell us, Tell us why did you write this book on Beethoven in China? Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for inviting us too. It's really nice to be here with you and with everybody. Um, as you mentioned, this is a we're a husband and wife team, and so this is a fairly personal book. Um, I had I had known for a long time how much Beethoven mattered to my husband. That he just was probably the most important composer and musician in my husband's life. And I knew he had a great story from the Cultural Revolution. You know, he grew up in China, in Beijing. And during the Cultural Revolution, during the period when the school shut down and um, there was no school for a couple of years, and they were just told to throw rocks through the school windows. And they reached a point when all the school windows were already broken and there wasn't a whole lot to do. And his friend Wang Luyan, who's an artist now, a very well-known artist, invited him to go, I think, to his uncle's house because he'd found an old phonograph and some old 78 RPM records. So they snuck into the house they curtained the windows, they closed the doors, and they put on the records, and it was Beethoven. Right, and on these old records, like each, each one lasted about five minutes, and so you had to play seven or eight records to hear a whole symphony. And that was his first exposure to Western classical music and to Beethoven. And he was just, right, and he was just really struck by the music, and he loved it, but then he didn't hear it again, but he went on and he learned to study the violin, and he became a conductor who conducted for Madame Mao and Ceausescu and Kim Il-sung and a whole, a whole range of leaders from that part of the world. And so fast forward, he came to the US, we married, et cetera. And he was opening a new concert hall at Stanford and he decided to do all the, all the Beethoven symphonies to celebrate the opening and then take the orchestra to tour Europe in Beethoven's footsteps. 
So we found ourselves 2013, 2014 in Vienna, in the cemetery where Beethoven is buried, right on the outskirts of Vienna. And we were standing there with our kids and we were just looking at the grave and we heard a crowd of Chinese coming towards us. And my son was listening, I wasn't paying attention. And my son heard them saying, they were saying, where's Beethoven, where's Beethoven? And my son called to me and he said, Beethoven's over here. And they came over and they all had flowers and they'd come all the way from Beijing. Nobody spoke English, nobody spoke German. They couldn't even read Beethoven, but they'd come all the way to Vienna to lay flowers on Beethoven's tomb. And that just really moved me. And I said, okay, it's not just my husband. There's a much deeper reason why Chinese people are so in love with Beethoven. And I decided that we would try to understand what it is. And so that sort of spurred the reason we wrote the book. Yeah, wow, what a story. Um, now, Jingdong, I understand you have um, some old photographs. You can tell us uh, the probably meaningful to you in writing this book. You are muted at the source. Uh, yes, uh, and, um, Penguin asked us to write uh, books about the Chinese culture. That's when Sheila recommended to say, why don't we uh, write about the Beethoven in China? So that's how we, we started. And uh, so then throughout the uh, you know, research and uh, interviews, and then we really find that some, some fascinating stories. And uh, the story is just for regular people. It's not really for musicians, not only for the musicians, but for everyone interested in China, interested in Chinese culture. So, so, so the Beethoven, you know, Beethoven was introduced to China as humanity figure. It's not really a musician because nobody heard his music. So I want to give you a little, a little tour, okay, about this book. There's some pictures I want to show you. So through this uh, presentation, you will understand what we were, were writing. And uh, let me see. Okay, so let's see. Yeah, so the first person to int introduce Beethoven to China, back to China, is, in, is Li Shutong in 1905. And uh, Sheila, maybe you can tell everyone the, the background back there historically. Yeah, so of course, this is a really tumultuous period in Chinese history, the, the turn of the 20th century. And 1905 is a critical year because it's the year they abolished the Confucian exam system that had been used to promote officials for hundreds and hundreds of years. And so people were really, it was a period of great questioning. China was being, the saying was carved up by a ripe melon by Western powers. Uh, they saw Japan growing stronger, but China was growing weaker. And so people, intellectuals in China were just kind of trying to figure out what to do. And many of them went abroad to sort of study how, how other countries were succeeding. And people were particularly interested in Japan because Japan was an Asian country, but it was still managed to maintain its own culture and to be strong despite the impact of the West. And Li Shutong is one of those people who went to Japan to study. Yes. Yeah. yeah, and in, in Japan, he studied the Western painting and he plays Shakespeare theater, in theater and also he studied music. Look at the, what, the right is a, a nude uh, painting he, he, he did in, while he was in Japan. And that was actually his landlord's daughter and later actually came back to China with him uh, to live together until he decided to uh, to shave his head and become a monk. So that's uh, uh, Li, uh, Li Shutong. And while he was in Japan, he organized to publish this little book it's called Little Music Magazine. And in that magazine, that's in 1905, he did this drawing, a charcoal drawing about Beethoven. And also he wrote a little article about Beethoven's, uh, his life. So it's, a, it's not a very long article, but really it said this person and went through difficulties. He cannot hear and his uh, father is drunk and his uh, nephew treat him very badly, um, but he wrote great music and all European people are just a triumph about him. So that was the first time in Beethoven was introduced to China. Right, and so Li Shutong was really uh, uh, looking for, for um, people that uh, Chinese could emulate, for role models. And he called the article, The Stage of Music. So he's really coming from a Confucian tradition and looking for a new sort of moral example or role model that Chinese people could emulate and Beethoven fit the bill for him because he had faced so much hardship and he had overcome so much hardship 
and he'd gone on to become one of the most successful and popular composers in the world. So he's really seeing as something that Chinese people could model themselves after and that China as a country could also do. It was in a down period, but it was gonna be great again. That's right. And back then, you know, um, Chinese people never heard Beethoven's music. So this is just a read about Beethoven. And not until 1920s. And Xiao Yomei, that's another uh, uh, Chinese educator and musician, actually, he started to introduce Beethoven's music to China. And he, earlier time, he worked for Sun Yat-sen in the revolution. Then uh, he went to Germany, he went to Leipzig to study music and he got a doctor degree from Leipzig University and came back to China, want to reform Chinese music. He came to Beijing because Cai Yuanpei was in Beijing and asked him to come to Beijing to help to establish music and arts program. Right, and Cai Yuanpei was also a great educator who also studied in Germany and they crossed paths in Leipzig and they both really believed in the transformative power of art. They thought that art and music could really, it could transform you on an individual level and it could transform a nation on a national level. And they loved German society and culture. They saw it as strong and well-ordered and civilized. And they thought if we brought some of that kind of music to China, we can make China strong and well-ordered and civilized. So it was, it always had another purpose. They loved Beethoven, they loved the music, but they were always looking for, they had a social goal in mind in, in a lot of this. That's mm. right. And in 1922, he created this, uh, a little orchestra in Beijing University, uh, Peking University. And, and you can see people dressed like uh, the traditional Chinese uh, costume. And uh, the really, they can, they can put it together. There's 15 people and actually lay a little orchestra. It's, but with this orchestra, it was the first Chinese people organized the orchestra play Beethoven symphonies in Beijing University. They have a regularly concert every week for quite a long, some, some time. And you can see um, there's 30 musicians and also if the, the, the parts uh, cannot be covered by those people, then there's a pianist on the, on the left. Uh, he, is, uh, he, he was a Russian and he played the piano to cover the parts and not covered in the instrument. So this is the first time a Chinese orchestra and played Beethoven symphony. Right, and it's also interesting that Xiao Yomei wrote very detailed program notes to explain the music and he localized it. You know, he explained the third symphony which Beethoven had originally dedicated to Napoleon and then he crossed out the dedication. But he said if Beethoven had known about China, he definitely would have dedicated this to Sun Yat-sen because Sun Yat-sen is the kind of reformer hero that he would want to be composing about. And the fifth is you know, seen as coming out of a period of darkness. And he said, this is perfect for China because we're going to come out of a period of darkness now too. If you go to Peking University, you still find those programs. And a few years ago, and I did a concert actually in Peking University to use a Peking University student orchestra at Stanford Center, we recreated this, uh, this situation to play the Beethoven Sixth Symphony um, for, uh, for a, a, a special program about uh, Peking University. That's wonderful. Yeah. yeah. And then for a foreigner, you know, and as you know, after Opium War, China opened uh, five uh, coastal cities to, for, for uh, foreign merchants to come to do business. And Shanghai become one of those four cities. And uh, Shanghai um, developed really well, you know, in the, by the end of the 19th century, there's uh, quite a few uh, foreigners that live and uh, doing business in Shanghai. So Shanghai created the first uh, Chinese professional orchestra, I will say, is in 1879. The, the Shanghai is called Shanghai Public Band. It started and after a, start from band, but to gradually develop into a symphony orchestra. So this is a, a, a picture from 1910, uh, around that time. And uh, the conductor is a German conductor. His name is Rudolf Buch. And he organized this orchestra become expanded and then start to play Beethoven symphony. So this is the, uh, we can find, this is the Shanghai Symphony, the earliest program we can find is from 1911. And on the third item, uh, in the program, it, they performed the, the finale of the uh, Eroica Symphony. And the next big wave is uh, in 1919. And this Italian conductor, Mario Pacci, he came to China and uh, to develop the, China, uh, the Shanghai Municipal Orchestra. Sheila, you want to say a little bit about Pachi? 
Yeah, yeah Pachi was um, was an Italian conductor who also really loved Beethoven. And um, he came, and at the time, this is what, the music in China, Beethoven proceeded on two tracks in China. The first is the one we told you about with Chinese intellectuals introducing him in writing. The second was foreigners playing Beethoven with their own orchestra with only foreign audiences because they played in places like the town hall and the public garden where Chinese weren't allowed. So the music was performed, but Chinese would have heard it only if they passed by the park or they were an IE with somebody that got to go in. They didn't get to go and attend the concerts in any formal way. But Pachi thought that was ridiculous. He said the Chinese are really musical people. He wanted to grow his audience. And he went to the municipal council after a couple of years and said, if you don't start letting Chinese people into the, into the concert halls, I'm gonna quit. And they listened to him and they started letting Chinese people into the concert halls. And very quickly, they grew to be a significant portion of the audience. So at that point, Chinese people could not just read about Beethoven, but they could, they could hear Beethoven's music perform. So you kind of see a merger of, of Beethoven, the sage of music, and Beethoven, the actual composer. Yes, by 1930s, there, there are a few uh, Chinese musicians play in the orchestra, and this is in the from 1936 performance and of Beethoven Symphony Number no. Nine, the last moment. You can see they engaged uh, a chorus actually from from Shanghai to Chinese chorus and combined with the Western uh, Westerners chorus. So this is a, right. a, it's also important to mention that the very first time a Chinese performed in the orchestra was a celebration of Beethoven's 100th anniversary. Tan Shu Jian joined the orchestra in 1927 and he played, the first thing he played was Beethoven's fifth. So it's it, the, the first Chinese orchestra musicians were playing Beethoven from the start. And then from 1930s, there are lots of uh, uh, publications also introduced after Li Shutong. There's so many uh, uh, Beethoven introduced, uh, lots of writings, lots of uh, uh, publications that introduced Beethoven. And Fu Lei is the one of the most important uh, translator and to to really introduce Beethoven into Chinese society. Right. So Fu Lei is is very famous as a translator of of French literature into Chinese. Um, but he was also very important because he he went to he went to Paris I think in the early 1920s and he studied French and he had he has struggled he had a hard time when he was there he didn't have a ton of money his father had died when he was four years old. And he somehow came across a copy of The Life of Beethoven that was written by Romain Rolland, who was actually a Nobel Prize winning author, who also really loved Beethoven. And so Foulet came across this Life of Beethoven at a time that was very difficult for him. And he basically said that when he started reading about Beethoven, it just changed his whole world. It was like the sun came out. Um, what did he say? He said, um, I burst into tears and suddenly felt as if I'd been enlightened by the divine light and gained the power of rebirth. From that time on, I wonderfully took heart, which was indeed a great event in my whole life. This is just reading about Beethoven. So Fu Lei, when he goes back to China and China is being invaded by Japan and it's a really terrible time, he decides the best thing he can do as a writer and translator is translate this book about Beethoven into Chinese so everyone else could wonderfully take heart and be reborn by learning about Beethoven. So he translated the life of Beethoven into Chinese. And then he also translated the novel Jean Christophe, which is a four volume, very long novel based on the life of Beethoven, so fictionalized Beethoven, also by Romain Roland, and he translated that twice. He did it once, and then he wanted to get better, and he translated it again. And it's interesting to note that that book still, Xi Jinping has read that book. That book remained very popular in China for a very long time, even after it was no longer read in the West. Yeah, last year, um, last summer, uh, the past this summer, last year, and I went back to Beijing and got my old books, the Chinese translation of the Johann Kirchhoff. And I look at those books and I have this markers, mark this line. It's, a, it's a like, a, it bring me back to my, you know, uh, early time to see how I was passionate. I was so moved by this, this book. Right, it's, it's a very romantic depiction of an artist and everywhere he goes, the leaves blow, he hears music. The, there's a bird singing, he hears music. It's just this very, it's beautifully written. Yeah, and also uh, Fule, it's also uh, Fule, almost like a united this Beethoven world in China because before him, there's tons of Beethoven books and even translating the name of Beethoven, there's like a, 20 different type, Beethoven, Beethoven, uh, you know, it's, a, it's a all over the places. And after his translation, actually, now we only use this Beethoven, the three words, as a, to introduce mm -hmm. Beethoven. It's a really, really important uh, uh, intellectual. And then we get, get to the new China. 
Man. In the beginning of the after 1940, 40, 49, right in the early 50s, and uh, they have uh, China had the big debate: should we have symphony orchestra or not? And then, and you know, Shanghai Symphony is all foreign symphony, and we should abandon to them. But other side of the story to say we need to keep this, especially the mayor Chen Yi, and really saved the Shanghai Municipal Orchestra and changed to the Shanghai Symphony. And uh, really, uh, then in Beijing, from 1950s, China influenced by Soviet Union. So they send lots of uh, musicians, be, besides the uh, scientists, they send musicians to, to Moscow, to um, St. Petersburg to study music. And also uh, many of the Eastern European orchestras and, and musicians come to China to help China develop classical music. I will say um, from 1950s, most of the Chinese um, fine arts institu institution, the ballet theaters and the uh, uh, symphony orchestras, the opera houses really created with uh, Soviet Union's help. Right, and the Soviet Union was just so instrumental in, in building and protecting classical music and defending it against Chinese who thought it was bourgeois because Chinese who didn't think it was bourgeois and thought it could serve the workers, soldiers and, you know, uh, front, military, whatever they said. So they, they said, look, the, the Soviets like it, so we can use it too. And Beethoven was very popular in the Soviet Union because Lenin loved Beethoven. He loved the Appassionata. He even has this wonderful piece he wrote when he said, whenever I hear the Appassionata, it makes me really sympathetic towards people and it makes me really love them, but that's really bad for a revolutionary. So I can't listen to Beethoven because basically it makes him too nice. So he wouldn't, he said, I can't listen to him. But so they played a really, a really, a really key role in promoting Beethoven as a revolutionary composer. They said that, you know, Beethoven preferred the Russian pronunciation of his name to the German pronunciation of his name. And only, only people in communist countries can really understand Beethoven because his whole goal in life is to serve the people. So you have to be in a communist country if you're really gonna understand Beethoven. And this is the first time the new China po uh, performed Beethoven Ninth Symphony. And this is in Shoudu uh, uh, in, in Wang Fujing, if you know the place, you know, it's actually, it's not that big theater, but back then actually it's big. So they first time played complete Beethoven Symphony Number no. Nine. And there was a little, little bit of discussion at a debate about uh, translation because they're singing in Chinese. And when you uh, face the word God, what you can translate, then there's a, uh, there's a period that actually translate uh, not God, not to God, they translate that to heaven, shang, uh, tian, shang tian, shang di. So it's, 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 so then we'll, we'll try to, try to get, get shortcut to, to not to create any political, uh, you know, situation. It's really interesting back then. But in the end, actually, they used the God, the, the word of God. And also 1959 is the establishment of New China and the, the orchestra with the Dresden Philharmonic. The 10th anniversary. So, yeah, the, the, yeah, the, exactly. And it's the 10th anniversary of the establishment of the New China. So they performed Agamemnon Overture and, uh, and, uh, uh, Spring Festival Overture and in the newly uh, built uh, Great Hall people. And we believe Mao Zedong um, was the only time Beethoven, uh, uh, Mao Zedong heard the Beethoven, Beethoven piece in the Great Hall people at the Eichmann Overture. And then we can do the, uh, the Cultural Revolution in 1960s, you know, and this uh, is a turmoil. It's a just a disaster in China. Anything old and anything foreign is so bad, forbidden. And uh, many, many uh, intellectuals and uh, musicians suffered. Like Fu Lei, we mentioned, right? And so, so in, in the Shanghai, Shanghai Conservatory and the Shanghai, Shanghai Music World, but Shanghai Conservatory, there are 17 uh, professors uh, commit suicide. Mm -hmm. And uh, also Fu Lei, and he also committed suicide. And Sheila, you want to say a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, Fu Lei and his wife committed suicide fairly early on in the Cultural Revolution. They were struggled against, and people now. Red Guards came to their house and tore everything apart and and he had never done anything. There was nothing against him, but finally they found an old trunk in the attic that he was holding for a relative, a distant relative. And they tore the trunk apart and they found the mirror and they tore the backing off the mirror and they found a picture of Deng Kai-shek. And they said, see, you know, you're, you're, you're working with Taiwan or something like that. And he just said, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not gonna do this. And he went to his desk and he wrote a note and he had some library books to return, some bills to pay. And then he and his wife just went and, and hung themselves in their bedroom. Mm. Really, really tragic. Yeah, 
another uh, famous conductor, actually Lu Hongen, also uh, he didn't kill himself, but the the you know the government killed him. Um, so he is really living in the same period as like Jiang Qing was, uh, Madame Mao was in Shanghai and so on. So he kind of know the history. So when, when the Cultural Revolution start, then he just say, you know, this is nonsense. And the Beethoven, he said, the very famous, he said, that, you know, um, we, um, uh, and we, we shouldn't, uh, they want the, uh, what do you say? They want workers and peasants, and you know they need to. Uh, what is what he said? He said that you know the workers and peasants need to learn from Beethoven. It's not the other way around. So mm -hmm. then getting him in, in trouble, and actually, and then he start to tear this little red book, and then that is really uh, forbidden. So then basically, the Gong uh, Yu is officially arrest him. To, to name his uh, counter revolutionist. So they beating him and then they ask him to confess and he really never confessed. Right, he just said, I have no, you know, he, they wanted to criticize his teacher, Hulu Ting, and they wanted him to criticize Beethoven. He said, I'm not, I'm not gonna criticize them. He just wouldn't do it. He didn't play the game. And his, his favorite uh, two Beethoven pieces were the third, I think, and the Misa Solemnus. And yeah. so whenever he'd come back from being beaten or struggled against, he would hum, hum one of those pieces. And he had a cellmate called uh, Liu Wenzhong, who, who later wrote a book, which is how we know all this stuff. And um, when he realized uh, the last time they, they, the, the Red Guard said to him, look, Liu Hongen, do you want to live or do you want to die? Because you can't keep saying these things if you want to live. And he sort of sat there and took the question seriously and thought about it and said, I'd really like to live. I, I love life. But if it's living like this with no culture and no beauty, no art, and it's all lies, actually, I don't really want to live. And they sentenced him to death. And when he was going to be taken out to be executed, he, he went to his cellmate and he said, if this ever ends and you ever get a chance to leave China, please go to Vienna, the home of music, and go to the tomb of Beethoven and lay a bouquet of flowers on his grave and tell him that his Chinese disciple, Lu Hongan, went to his execution humming the Misa Solemnus. And he actually did that. He left the cell humming the Misa Solemnus and he was executed. And years later, Liu Wenzhong went to Vienna and, and put a bouquet of flowers there on the grave for him. His, his story is just so moving. Every time when I read, you know, even today, if I, when I talk to, about his story, I still get, feel so moved. And uh, when, when we wrote the book, we was in Shanghai, we visited and his son, his son was still alive. And uh, during the Cultural Revolution, his son said, you know, the most, the best time was when I was young, live in the, in, the, in the Shanghai Symphony Orchestra's compound. I feel so proud of my father. And then that's up to, and then the Cultural Revolution, they sent his son to Xinjiang. And that's uh, when, before he died, he also told Liu Wenzhong, said, you know, there are two things. One, you go to Vienna, another one, go to Xinjiang, find my son, to tell him how I died. Mm -hmm. it, yeah, this is, uh, so this is his conducting, and this is the, the day, and after they execute him, and this in Jiefang Rebao, you know, it's uh, to tell, tell public, and he and another seven uh, counter-revolutionists are being executed. And then after that, well, the 70s, well, we came to U.S.-China relationship. And Nixon visited China in 1972. But, uh, but before he visited, uh, Kissinger visited China. And uh, Zhou Enlai and talked to this conductor leader and to say, you know, Kissinger is German. We need to play Beethoven for him. So they, so they start to just try to quickly uh, put together this uh, Beethoven symphony. And, but which one Beethoven symphony is going to perform? There's a big debate because between Jiang Qing people and uh, Li Dolun. Li Dolun said we need to do Beethoven fifths. And then the Yu Huiyong, who is the minister of a cultural, uh, cultural ministry, and, and then he said, no, the Beethoven fifths is about the fate. We don't believe fate. And then Li Dolun said, let's do Beethoven three. And Eroica, then uh, Yu Huiyong said, no, the number mm -hmm. three is not because it's about Napoleon. And in the end, they agreed to do Beethoven six because six is about the pastoral. It's about the happy feeling of the peasants. <laughs> so that's a pass that actually. So when we, um, when we, uh, just before we wrote this book, we, you know, we interviewed Li Dolun. Li, Li Dolun said, you know, I didn't tell them the, those uh, peasants actually is a landlord. It's not really peasants. 
<laughs> so, and then 1973, after Nixon visited China, they started a cultural exchange. I feel this is very important. Actually, it's very relevant even for today. And the first American symphony orchestra, but the Philadelphia Orchestra visited China in 1973 under the baton of uh, Eugene Ormandy. That's really gave us so many, everyone, you know, in China to feel that it's some kind of signal to say cultural revolution actually may be finished. And we have this American orchestra came to play Beethoven. And there's a lot of story about the, how um, in the last minutes, you know, they want, they ask the Philadelphia to play the Beethoven Sixth Symphony, and, and which Eugene Ormandy didn't like. He, you know, he said, I hate Beethoven Six because it's not very gigantic. And, but, um, but they, they said, you have to play. So in the end, he played the Beethoven Symphony with the Chinese music parts and so on. So that's the, that's the history. And then actually he came to the, uh, the Central uh, Philharmonic to uh, with the musician to some exchange. And Li Dolan, in that rehearsal, Li Dolan played Beethoven Fifth Symphony for, for him. So after the first movement, Li Dolan said, Maestro, why do you play the second movement? And then uh, Eugene Omni, you can see this picture, he start the second movement of Beethoven Fifth Symphony in the rehearsal. And uh, there are some Philadelphia orchestras, peop, um, you know, musicians said, you know, when he started to conduct, the orchestra sound suddenly changed. They sound like a Philadelphia orchestra. <laughs> and <laughs> so this, uh, as it, so it, even, you know, today, I think people um, know, remember Philadelphia orchestra this journey in 1973. In 1980, then really and China start to open the door and there's a Beethoven favor in Shanghai. This is outside of Shanghai Symphony Hall and people, you know, stay there for overnight, try to find the tickets to play, to, to, to listen to the complete Beethoven Symphony uh, performance. Then of course today, you know, that's uh, um, Beit and not Western classical music in China become really China become the powerhouse of Western classic music. And they produce uh, seven, more than 70% of piano every year in the world. And they produce millions of uh, string instruments and in the world. And every year there's a new symphony orchestra created, a new concert hall created. So it's really uh, and classical music in China. It's a flourishing uh, dramatically. I would say, and some really will have to give the credit to the Philadelphia Orchestra's visit. And also today, you know, in American orchestra, you can say every American orchestra's opera houses and conservatories, and they all have Chinese musicians play in it. Mm -hmm. And China still, you know, very favorite on Beethoven. This is a, a Beethoven uh, called uh, the Natural Park, a wild, wild park. It's called Beethoven Wild Park. And this is a, I have many cities that have Beethoven gardens or Beethoven Gongyuan, you know, park. So this is another one has Beethoven structure in center of this park uh, in Guangdong. And this is in Harbin, you know, this is made of a snow. Uh, it's a big snow festival. They car carve the snow to a Beethoven. And this one is in Qingdao. It's a big Beethoven park and so on. So, so you can see um, Beethoven really taking still taking roots in China. And uh, this year, it's a 250 years of Beethoven's birth. So that's why I think uh, it's so appropriate for uh, May and to get this uh, uh, op opportunity to introduce Beethoven and uh, our book. Thank you very much. Thank you. What an amazing history. And by the way, you have to tell us about the Beethoven statue behind you, Jin Dong. Yeah, the Beethoven, yeah, you can see there's a little statue of Beethoven behind me. Actually, I just got this last week because my birthday and Sheila, my wife, secretly ordered this, uh, uh, this piece. Actually, it's a 1900 antique of Beethoven, a French art by a French artist. I was so moved. Wow. And, uh, thank you, Sheila. <laughs> How thoughtful, how thoughtful, a wonderful story. Now, um, as you were talking, I, I was thinking, you know, I was exposed to Beethoven, I think in the late 1980s in a foreign language school. And we had a principal who insisted on saying, if you are studying English, you have to learn something about Western civilization. Beethoven was the first 
um, name that uh, we were exposed to. And of course, reading the Yuhan Kulistofu, that that novel was everyone, every, every one of my classmates. So it's, it's, it resonated with me big time, your book. It just brought back um, some of these memories. Um, now, I have, the first question I have though, is uh, you talked about how Beethoven has this um, almost godlike status in China, but there are so many Western musicians. Uh, what about Beethoven that that made him achieve such status there? In fact, well, he's not there to promote his music, right? Uh, so what does it tell us about the Chinese? What do Chinese see in him? Is it the music or is it the, the journey, the defiance of the hardship uh, that Chinese are most drawn to, do you think? Yeah, I think, you know, Chinese people find be themselves, you know, Beethoven in themselves. That's, I think, is very important. When you read this story about Beethoven, it's a, it's a uh, you, you know, go through a turmoil, you through obstacles, but only when you go through this, you can have a triumph. So mm -hmm. this is like a trickle, and then in the end, you can succeed. I think that is a very important message, and um, especially in the, the, the early 20th century, you know, when China tried to search where we go, and young people try to find a solution to save China and to, you know, so that's Beethoven become, that's why Beethoven become, like you said, is a godlike a figure and to, to really have the impact in, in, in the young people. Mm -hmm. the, so why, is there someone else that you think about Western music, how about Mozart? Because the story is different. Yeah, I, I think, you know, throughout the music history in the world, uh, it's no one can take place, Beethoven's place. No, no, any other composers can take Beethoven's place. Because Beethoven, we say, you know, I read the book during the, uh, the Cultural Revolution and just, just sneak into the library to get this uh, translated book uh, called the Yue uh, de Jie Fang Zhe, Beethoven. It's a, the, liber, mu, the liberator of music, Beethoven. So that's, I think that's, it's anywhere in any country in the history, that's what Beethoven take place. If you go to Boston Symphony Hall, you know, and the Symphony Hall, there's a, there's a one uh, thing in the front of that proscenium and it said Beethoven. And so, yeah. so I think that, that that's yeah. universal. Yeah, go ahead. No. Yeah, I agree it's universal. I, I think also, I, I think, you have to look at the way Beethoven was introduced, you know, and the fact that he survived the Cultural Revolution and all that he survived, you know, that he survived 1949 because the Russians liked him too. He survived the Cultural Revolution. The fact that he was seen as a revolutionary really helped him in China too, you know, because he was seen as, as revolutionizing music so you could defend him better, you know, and also the music was big, it was powerful. Um, so I think it just, it becomes layers and layers of reasons, you know, if he'd been banned in the 30s or 40s, or the Cultural Revolution, then maybe he wouldn't be so big today, but, but he wasn't banned, he survived. And there's other composers like Chopin, people, are, people like Chopin a lot. Chopin has kind of a similar story of loving the motherland so much, you know, having his heart buried back in Poland. There's stories, but the key is I think people, to have broad masses of people, you have to relate to the story and not just the music. Because most people aren't going, in any country, most people aren't going to symphony orchestras. So it's the story of Beethoven's life, I think, that really brought people along in the beginning. And, you know, his story is still in middle school textbooks. They don't read the whole life of Beethoven, as translated by Pule anymore, but the, the, his, a little piece of his life story is still in every middle school textbook in China. I bet that's not true in Germany. You know, so people in China are still growing up learning his story. So I, I think that's a lot of the reason. It's just history, you know, layer upon layer of, of Beethoven. He becomes the most important that way. Mm, that's very interesting. That, that, that's the question I was probing at, thinking this fascination with Beethoven, is it uh, specific to the Chinese people or is it universal? And I think you just answered the question. I think there's, there's a hum, sort of humanity in him that is appealing to all human, humans around the world, except the Chinese through the past strange history of a hundred years had many different iterations of how we accept him into our culture. 
Right. Yeah. And what other country can say you had people literally dying for Beethoven? That's you know, right. the Chinese, the Chinese understanding of Beethoven is very, very strong. You know, maybe it's not the Germans, but they have an interpretation, a really valid argument for Beethoven being, you know, one of their composers too, I would yeah. say. Uh, yeah, like uh, this year, you know, and uh, the, there's so much Beethoven going on in China in this moment. Like the Shanghai Concert Hall uh, put together this most uh, technical or uh, brilliant uh, Beethoven exhibition in Shanghai Concert Hall. And then also, you know, it's in the West, usually we play Beethoven piece, we play Beethoven's uh, music, but in China, there's a Hua Ju a spoken drama, Beethoven. And there's a musical actually singing just a pop song, but it's called Beethoven. It's an old, they, they, you know, they have no boundaries and they just, it says, how about this, there's a market and also they love Beethoven and here you are, we do Beethoven, all different kind of. Yeah, when Chinese embraces him, it goes all out. <laughs> all out. Exactly. Breaking all the boundaries. Yeah. Now, I want to probe a little bit of, from a, a learning of uh, Beethoven as a child. How did you each separately come to his music? And Jingdong particularly, I, I know you grew up in an era um, where music wasn't available. Like, even just to hear the music note wasn't available, not to mention learning the music and, uh, you know, becoming a musician. What was your journey? And Sheila, I'd love to hear your story, too. Yeah, well, Sheila told my er the, the, the earliest journey about first time I listened to Beethoven's recording, yeah. right? And then after that, I remember 1976, there was a big earthquake. Everyone get on the street. And that's the thing. And when I was living on the street, basically I sneak into this labor, laboratory, uh, labor, uh, library to find this uh, book to read about the liberate, you know, liberator, Beethoven's a mu liberator of music. So that really touched me. And then, and I think gradually I started to start to play the violin and then, and then went to the college. And then it's, I think another important impact on me is in 1979, uh, when there's an orchestra visit China, you know, Car Young bring the uh, Berlin Philharmonic came to China. I, I went to every single rehearsal, every concert and look at the, him, you know, in the concert. And, 5,000 people, you can hear a pin drop. It's so quiet. And there was no cell phone, of course. But at the same time, you can see this master, you know, with, with the eye cl eyes closed and barely move anything. But Oxford came out this Beethoven song just you never heard before in life. So that really uh, just shocked me. And then a couple of months later, C.T. Ozawa took the Boston Symphony came to Beijing. I went to that too. And you see C.T. Ozawa is using every part of body move. It's, but the orchestra also come out with this fantastic song. You know, so all those really impact me a great deal. And I decide to be a musician and to be conductor. And I also say, if I want to be conductor, I want to come to the West to study. So that's why I came to Boston. I went to the New England Conservatory. And then I, uh, there's one year in 1989, I have the uh, opportunity to study with Bernstein in Tanglewood. And that also is a really so the most memorable and to feel like, uh, you know, he is not just teaching you how to conduct a piece of music. He's teaching you how to be a musician, how to be a great human being. So that's, it's, it's all those, you know, gradually really will say, build myself of what they are, what, what, what I am today. Mm. I, I want to probe this one more before I uh, go to Sheila. Your mm. mother, this is actually a, a question probed by the audience, but I also happen to know, uh, I met Jin Yong and I know Jin Qing, Jin Qing is more my age. Um, and your mother brought up very successful children and how, what, what role did music play at home and your passion for music, did that impact your siblings? <laughs> well, I think the most important thing for my parents is they gave us a lot of freedom. And they, they, they didn't, you know, forbidden us to do this or do that. But also my father did. One thing is um, during the Cultural Revolution, and uh, he knows I love music. I played Arhu, you know, something. And then um, I 
but also I went to street with the, uh, the class, uh, older classmen to break windows in the school. And then he realized, you know, he, he, he don't, shouldn't do that. So he bought uh, in, a, uh, in a dump shop. Uh, he pawn bought shop. A, pawn shop. Pawn shop. A pawn shop. He, in a pawn shop, he uh, dump pool, let's say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so we uh, bought a, a Japanese made violin. So bring home, and I, from there on, I start to st uh, play the violin. So that actually is uh, my parents, um, my father's really the beginning of gave me this opportunity to study the violin, and and that's how I start. And I think, uh, um, you know, I, I asked my uh, brother to learn to play the flute and Jing Qing. I think Jing also played flute actually mm -hmm. uh, for, for a short time. And so mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm the oldest among of um, our four siblings and, uh, but I'm the only one went on to become a musician. Mm -hmm. So your advice for parents is give the kids freedom and be an enabler. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Now, uh, Sheila, um, did you fall in love with Jingdong because of classical music, because of Beethoven? <laughs> Well, no, but I met him through classical music because I wrote a story. He came to Shanghai to conduct the Shanghai Symphony and he was doing uh, John Craig Leon, actually new music, but I wrote a piece on it and that's actually how we met. So mm -hmm. yeah, the Beethoven yeah, came I later. In, yeah, I was in, uh, I came back and uh, you know, she, Sheila interviewed me and I came back. My friend said, hey, there's a, a big story about your concert in Shanghai at the Wall Street Journal. So then I, yeah, and then I, I write an email to her. I said, thank you for this. And a year later, one uh, an year and a half later, I went to Shanghai again to do another concert. Uh, and then, you know, I was wondering if this lady is still there. So I contacted her and then rest is history. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful, wonderful love story. Music being the main, uh, right. The yeah. Right? Yeah. right? Yeah, terrific. Now, uh, for anyone who had with questions, please, you can put them in the question the chat box or directly in the chat box, but I have one or two more questions. Mm -hmm. one, um, one very interesting thing is the current phenomena of Chinese parents making their children's practice. And funny enough, for Wild China's book club series, we launched off with the first book by Amy Chua, Battleheim of the Tiger Mom, right? So you know she, um, how she sort of conditioned her two girls, two daughters to play piano and violin. Eventually, none of them uh, became a professional. They both went into law. Uh, so what, Jingdong, particularly as an educator, I'm curious about your thoughts on the parental approach to introduce this Chinese approach of giving children uh, classical music like that. And secondly, is why do Chinese parents care so much? They actually, not a lot of them expect their children to become musicians in the long term. So two parts yeah. to this question. Well, you know, when the, when the kids are young, all the parents encourage the kids to learn classical music. When they really fall in love with classical music, want to go to college, and then the parents start to try not to make them to go. Don't to be them. a musician. <laughs> Why torture so the kids? I know, that's a Chinese parents, you know, I think, um, um, you know, it, it's, uh, they want the kids learn classical music because they believe classical music can um, form their kids with great discipline. And you have to practice every day. You have to be profession, uh, pr uh, pr precision, you know, to make every note right place. So that actually do, it's very important for kids to grow, to grow up. So they do like this part, but also play classical music is, in Chinese culture is like a, it's a higher status, right? It's a, it's a, it just show this kids actually educated. And then which means the parents are, are it's actually been be named as educated. And where that's why in early times, you know, there's now parents want their kids to learn to play trombone or trumpets or uh, uh, brass instruments. They only want them to play the piano, the violin and the cello because that's what you see the stars, where the stars are, you know, Lang Lang or the Yundi or some. Huh. Yeah, but, uh, but I think, uh, uh, think that's have been changing. You know, it's a, they still want the kids to study music 
and because they that where they think they can get a better uh, discipline and good education and cultural 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 sense and arts. So, right, and and to be fair, you I, I think this also fits into the tradition of Chinese education, like the literati education. You know, they weren't playing Western instruments, but they were playing Chinese instruments. You know, since Confucius said music is what perfects you as a person, and so I think there's a very long tradition of studying music if you're an educated person. And there's lots of Chinese kids who are also studying Chinese instruments. It's not just Western instruments, that's our focus, but there's also many, many kids now studying Chinese instruments, including in the US. I mean, you don't see lots of kids here who are in Chinese ensembles and studying Chinese instruments. So I think that's just seen as a, a, a good part of, of, of an, an education. It makes you a sophisticated person, disciplined, and it's just good for to, to understand the arts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, I think uh, American parents need to continue to do that. You know, if you go to uh, major cities in America today, all the youth orchestras, you go to any of those major city youth orchestras, I would say 80% of the play, uh, young people, young musicians are Asian or Chinese, mm -hmm. Korean and Japanese. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a less and less American really get into music. I think that's it's a kind of a, a failure of public education and especially put arts in the back seat. And so that's, I think, I hope, you know, um, we can continue to improve that. In a way, it kind of plays the same role as sports in America, right? Yeah. You encourage your kids to swim and play tennis or whatever. You're looking for uh, cultivating the discipline in the kids. But when the kid says, mom, I'm going to college to play ball. And you're like, no, 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 no. <laughs> exactly. yeah. And it helps you get into college. You know, okay. if, you, if you're really good at piano in China, it will help you get into college too. So same as sports here, right? Yeah, sports here, yeah. So, so on the parental uh, methods for encouraging the kids to uh, to pick up music, is there a fundamental difference between the American parenting style and Asian parenting style? Like the Asian type being, you know, the kids want to go out, but here, you've got to sit down another hour. Is yeah, I think that there's a, a you know, a, a little different type. Some parents are more tiger uh, mother or tiger father. It really, you have to sit down to play an hour and every day. So that it's, you know, sometimes maybe you take it, it's good because the young kids, sometimes they don't know what they, they, is important and they need some guidance. And, but often I think, it, and, if they don't like music, then you should just let them go, whatever they like to do. And but if you, they like music, you can just let them play. But the thing is, and sometimes I feel as a, a parents, especially Chinese parents, um, or even the education in China, music education in China, people more focus on the technique, less focus on why you play music, why music is important part of a, a you know. A, human uh, needs to grow up and what art will influence this person what the gr gr great classical music will influence your grow so that i think and if if you know if we can pay more attention that will really serve um, this even better mm -hmm. there's um, a good question from the audience jeffrey tao says um, nowadays american university admission officers get really bored with chinese kids saying i'm a violin player um it seems like it, it led to some stereotyping of chinese youth can you comment on that i don't think it's a bad thing right it's a it's so it's everyone should everyone you know the arts education is so important for a young person for young people to grow up. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter if you're Chinese or you, you're Indian American or Chinese American. And the stereotype, you know, some people always have a stereotype on something. So, so I think, uh, uh, I don't know, you know, exactly how, uh, how, how not to do it. Right, it, uh, I just think that the music is so, so important part of everybody's it's life. And if Chinese um, parents or Korean parents or Japanese parents are actually really uh, think that this is important, I think the, social, the society need to accept them, need, need to, to, to it's, it's good, I think. Mm, yeah, no, I, I, I think it's I wonderful. Know that kids continue to want to compete on knowing music or playing music, right? Um, now, one thing I'm curious um, is the connection between Chinese traditional mu uh, musical instrument and classical music. As we 
I heard, I read in your book, Nie Ar, who is from Kunming, by the way, that's my hometown. That's right. And um, even when we were like in elementary school, we would go pay respect to his tomb in the Western Hills, but it's, it's only his clothing there. I, I don't think um, his body was ever found. Um, in any event, so he started from uh, bamboo flute, two string arhu and all these Chinese instruments. How do you, how do you connect from Chinese instruments and to classical music? He, he eventually went on to write our national anthem, right? Yeah, it's, uh, it's all music. Music had no boundaries. Music is the international language. And music, you know, you don't have to know any words. If you been, if you listen to, you feel it, then you can get it. So that's what I think it, 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 it's really, it's not that much different uh, in that sense between Western music and Chinese music. And of course, there are different format was well, the Chinese people always view uh, Western music more scientific. It's a more uh, sophisticated, but, but at the same time, Chinese music has a great tradition. You know, there, I think there's a, there's a, um, a, 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 if you say the difference, it will be the Chinese music always relates to nature, nature relate with something. If you see the Chinese music from the old the thousand years piece or piece, they're rarely using, you see any piece without title. They're always a title. A title always related to either the mountain or river or water or whatever, the feeling of people. Mm -hmm. I always have to relate with something other than music. So that what I see the Chinese music, how you can see the, the, the universe is one thing, music is a part of it. On the other hand, the Western music actually from, uh, ran, uh, I think after Renaissance, it start to, uh, Western art start to become very clear uh, boundary in, in different uh, genre, right? There's a, there's a art, fine arts and there's a classical music and there's a philosophy. And so they have an old line to develop us. Maybe that's the, the one of the reason to be, become more sophisticated. And the music in Western music, mostly they want to say, we, want, we only want to use music to express our feeling. So that's why you see this, uh, what we call a D major sonata or F major uh, symphony, they don't put title on it. But it doesn't mean the composer, when they compose it, doesn't have any, you know, historical feeling or, or that time. So I think that's maybe you can see the surface, surface. maybe that's the, it's a, it's a kind of a di different character of the stick. But in terms of music, they all same. You know, if you go to a conservatory today in China, you see talented violin player, piano player. Also, you can see very talented arhu player and pipa players. So it's to, a, go back, to go back to your question, you know, at the time of, of Nye, Nye around then, you know, the turn of the 20th century, at, in that period of time, Chinese musicians really didn't have very good status in society. You know, nobody knew the names of the musicians, really. Who, who were the composer? Nobody knew. They were just these tunes that were passed on and different people performed them. So one of the goals of people like Xiao Yomei and Tsai Yuanpei in introducing Western music to China was to raise the status of Chinese musicians and composers, to have them recognized as artists. That was, that was a sub goal. And that was one of the reasons for Beethoven, all these ind individual biographies showing, look, in the West, these people get recognition for what they've created. Here, we don't even know the names of the person who wrote the music. And, and, and also, as Jindal mentioned, they were, it, Western music was seen as technologically advanced. It was systematic, whereas Chinese had so many different kinds of notation. You know, everyone used different notation, whereas Western had this standardized, you know, Wuxianpu notation. So that was the whole reason. So it was, there was a formal system to study Western music, and there really wasn't a formal system for studying Chinese music. It was a master student relationship and, you know, but now there is, so it's really changed now, you know, th th that's one thing that the People's Republic did was to put the Chinese instruments and the Western instruments in the conservatory together and to treat them equally and to systematize it. And so they've mm -hmm. kind of influenced each other over the years. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. One last question, because this is kind of interesting to me as well. Does Russia still have an important role today in Chinese musical education? I think they still, it's, uh, you know, um, the, the Central Conservatory, for example, in Beijing, right? They were built by Russians. So their system, their teaching system, teaching methods, and they're still kind of a follow the Russian system. And it's a little different than the Shanghai Conservatory because Shanghai Conservatory was built by British and Western, you know, American, the British, that system. 
So um, like uh, what the difference between those two systems is the Russian system is very strict and uh, has a lot of practice exercises and, uh, and they, they make this a technical, it's a very formative, very, very strict. So that's, uh, and they have this it's an incredible system in, in that sense to train musicians. And so I think in that sense, and definitely they still have a very deep re uh, influence from super Russian. Uh, right, the system, the pedagogy, all that stuff came, came from the Soviet Union. And yeah. we didn't get to talk about it, but in Shanghai in the 1920s and 30s, there were so many white Russians who fled Russia That's and right. came and played. And you know, so the sound of the Shanghai Symphony, many people still say it sounds a little bit Russian. And also if you go up to Harbin, which is one of the earliest places to have classical music in China also. They've built a new conservatory, a new opera house, a new concert hall, and they have lots of Russian teachers there. There's lots of exchange again there. So the Russians from Russia today are, are playing a more active role in places like Harbin. Yes, yeah, well, thank you. I, th I think you just gave it the perfect plug because right now we can't travel. So that's why we bring China into your living room and study and whatever. So I hope next year, Everyone can call Wild China and go to Shanghai to go to visit Shanghai Symphony and go to Harbin to visit. Maybe they will make an ice festival statue of um, Beethoven again. <laughs> yeah, we are uh, actually um, at uh, Bard College. We have a, a China Now Music Festival every year. We, this is the third year we're doing China Now Music Festival. And because we cannot do it in Carnegie Hall, so now we move that online in December, from December 11th until 18th. And because China Now Music Festival, this year's theme is China and Beethoven. So uh, every night we'll have a different uh, uh, topic and different performance and some the performance actually live from China. So I hope you can log on our website and uh, to enjoy the, the uh, more Beethoven. And there's a movie called Beethoven in Beijing, which Jennifer Lin did. And it's also going to be shown at the festival and then on PBS next spring. So there's more Beethoven in China. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, we will connect separately. I absolutely want to get the links and share that with, with our audience. Thank you so much, Sheila. Thank you, Jing Dong, for taking the time. And uh, for all the audiences, thank you so much for taking the time. And um, it's a very worthy topic to celebrate. And thank you for writing the book, informing us about Beethoven in China. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, now, I just want to comment on last few words. We have many more events like this coming up. Uh, in December, Book Club will be reading China's New Youth by uh, Alec Ash. And we also will be talking to a conservationist, Kyle Oberman, about conservation national parks in China, all in December. And so if you want to join these events, just sign on to wildchina.com's newsletter. And I hope to see you again. And stay safe, stay healthy, everybody. Thank you again, Sheila. Thank you, Jing Dong. Thank hope you. To see you at the next dinner gathering before too long. Plan on it. <laughs> OK, thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.